everyone. Welcome to Flute Espresso brought to you by Flute Specialists. I'm Heather Neuenschwander from Flute Specialists, and I'm so excited to be here with Dr. Christine Potter. Hi, everybody. I'm coming to you from my, uh, my studio in Boulder, Colorado, where the sun has finally come out after three days of clouds. We're not used to clouds here. <laughs> we much prefer the sun. So, you know, I, I lived on Long Island for two years. It drove me crazy because it's just uniformly gray all the time. I'm originally from New Mexico, where, of course, it's sunny all the time. So that uh, that that drove me crazy to be where it's cloudy and you can't tell the, the, the time of day because it's just uniformly gray. But anyway, we're, we're sunny here today, which is just terrific. And I'm here. Here I've got my official mug. I have my official mug. It happens to have water in it right now. Water has no calories and it doesn't mess up the saliva content of your mouth. So if you want need to play something, water is the best, is your friend. Water is your friend. <laughs> All right. So for those of you joining us and listening with us today, the idea behind Flute Espresso is to be a casual coffee chat with famous flutists like Dr. Christine Powder here. Um, so we ask you to join us, grab your own cup of coffee or tea, or I guess water if you're taking a practice break. Um, and you can comment here to be a part of the discussion. It's not just the two of us, you're all invited in. So first maybe comment saying where you're joining from and maybe what you're drinking. And what we will do is we'll choose one person from the comments to receive a free copy of the new book, which we're going to talk about in just a second, Christmas Duets with a Twist by Christine Potter. Why don't you, you know, just tell us about it right now. Oh, well, twist my arm. Okay, so I have wanted to do a Christmas Duets book for a while, but when you uh, decide you're going to, you know, get a book out there, it really takes a lot of concentrated effort over, you know, like six weeks. And it's hard to find that much time uh, to have the headspace to get all those details uh, fresh every day. Um, but, you know, the first challenge is, okay, there are only, what, 300 Christmas carols out there? Which ones am I going to pick? So just going uh, through and trying to decide which ones you're going to put in the book and how many should you put in and, and all that. So that, that in itself is difficult. And then you have to get the get some uh, copyright free, you know, public domain pieces of which, you know, most of these are, um, most Christmas carols are in the public domain. And then you, you know, you look at what you can find and then you decide what you're gonna do with it and actually, you know, writing it down, what order am I gonna put them in, in the book? I mean, there are just so many little details. What font am I going to use? I mean, there's, <laughs> anyway, that's why it takes sometimes, uh, you have to wait to uh, find the space in your schedule to to do a book and i know that it seems simple enough when you look at it but i'm telling you uh, this was one actually one of the least time consuming ones i've done some of my other ones have taken years it seems um but i've wanted to do one for a long time uh because i really like christmas carols and they're fun to sing and it's just sort of a community building uh event and you know christmas as, as we know is one of the times when we get gigs and sometimes you uh need to have a bunch of background music at some holiday party and this is perfect they're intermediate level so uh most players could just you know sight read through them at the event itself so you don't have to put a huge time commitment in there um and that you want to ask well why what's the with the twist thing well um i wanted to have it a title that was going to uh, ask people would ask questions like why did she say with a twist because engagement is one of the whole ways you get people to look at the book um and so what i did in each of the little uh pieces i put some little extra something in there that's not in the original piece um just so that um you would be challenged just a little bit. So sometimes there was like some little motive that I like, motive that I liked. And so I repeated that a couple of times, which is again, not in the real Christmas Carol. Sometimes I put it in an interesting key. <laughs> 
Uh, so anyway, <laughs> each one of them has some little different something that I sort of slipped in there. And then the challenge came of how am I going to make a cover that goes with the title? And it just came, well, what twists and is Christmassy? And of course, it came to my mind, curling ribbon, of course. And so I, you know, piled a bunch of curling ribbon on the floor and put my, you know, flute parts in there and just started taking pictures uh, and figuring out what was going to look good and what wasn't going to look good. And uh, then I have a graphic designer. I, I'm not that good. I, I can do a lot of things. I'm not that good. I have a graphic designer and I send her what I think are the best pictures. And then she she turns it into a cover and she does the back, which has, you know, some of my other books in it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I just... It's just so fun. I, anything that makes me smile and laugh, I think, is a good thing for me. <laughs> oh, yeah! You know, when you look at it, you go, "Oh!" You know. And we were talking just before we we went live here on Facebook, and I wanted to be very prepared today, and I got my copy. Um, I wanted to read through with some students today. So excited to read through them. And um, Chris knows that my mailman brought it to me literally right before we started. It's still cold from being outside because I'm in Iowa. So it's just as great as it is in Colorado there, I, I hate to say. But I'm really excited to open it and play some of these. Tatiana commented, we're going to play some together. Um, <laughs> so I'm so excited. But we, we love the cover. It was the first thing that we noticed. We just absolutely love the cover. It's just such a creative idea. You're such a creative person. Um, Tell us about your other, well, you know, I skipped. I, I plan these things in my head and then I don't say them. Um, I skipped explaining who you are because I figure everybody knows who you are, but you are the low flutes expert. So if there's anybody watching here who does not know that Chris Potter is the low flutes expert, today is the day that you need to know. If there's something you need to know about alto flute, bass flute, contrabass flute, Chris Potter is the person that you will contact. The first chair of the NFA Low Flutes Committee You've organized an international low flutes festival attended by people around the world. Uh, this is your 17th year of organizing alto and bass retreats? I just, yes, this is my 17th year. I had three this year. I had three retreats, two of them in person. We so were good. actually in person. <laughs> We were all a little nervous. For the first one, I made, uh, well, actually for both of them, uh, people had to uh, show me their vaccine cards. They had to send me a scan of their vaccine cards mm -hmm. so that we could all be reasonably assured that, that we weren't going to give it to each other. Um, mm -hmm. So, but they, they worked really well. But yeah, 17 years. And again, I had three this year. One of them was in May. It was online. It was with Allie Ryerson. We had a great time. I called it Swing Low. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I just come up with these things. Anyway, I called it Swing Low, and that one was fabulous, I, I have to say, even for an online event. It was lots of interaction. I mean, we had breakout rooms, and people were rehearsing, and Allie and I were going around helping the different people, and we were doing sight reading stuff. And, I mean, it was it was exhausting, but 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 really fun. And that was, that was a blast. Then I had one uh, in uh, north of Seattle in a town called Marysville. And then that was in September. And then in October, uh, middle of October, I had one in Huntsville, Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned how to say y'all. Okay. And I'm trying to now excise that from my vocabulary. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also put, it's, this was your eighth year directing a low flutes choir at the James Galway Festival in Switzerland. <laughs> Uh, let's, yeah. let's hope they're having one. I haven't, okay. I haven't heard the last two years have been online, okay. uh, for, you know, just because of the COVID thing and he's in his eighties now and, you know, you gotta be careful. You just have to be careful. And I, I don't know what their plans are for the one, if there is going to be one in the summer, I hope there is. Um, okay. but yes, I, I, I've been there, uh, got even remember. eight years. Is that what I said? Several yes. years. Eight yes. is what was on your website. Oh, good. <laughs> it must be true then. Um, but that was really an honor to be asked to do that. And, and there's a whole interesting story about how that uh, whole thing transpired, and which I think I think it just will illustrate how 
Um, you have to put yourself forward, but not in, a, in an obnoxious way. And if opportunity presents itself, you take it. <laughs> so, so what happened is that I, uh, I knew somebody who had some money who wanted to commission a low flutes piece, and she wanted Matthias Ziegler to write this piece. And she didn't really know him, but I sort of knew him and I had you know, I was more visible in the community. So I emailed Matthias and said, would you write this low flutes, flutes piece? And he did. And it was a stunning, stunning piece called Low Flutes at High Tides, which we uh, premiered at the Las Vegas NFA convention um, several years ago. And so I knew that Matthias was a friend of the Galways and that he went to their uh, festival. He was a guest at their festival. And so, so I wrote to him and said, Matthias, we should do your piece at the Galway festival. <laughs> and he said, Oh, great. And um, so then uh he said, oh, he would contact Lady Jean. Well, I didn't hear from her. I didn't hear from her. So I finally, I just wrote to her and, and I still didn't hear back and didn't hear back. And then about six weeks later, she apologized. She writes me an email and apologizes for not getting back to me sooner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's one of the busiest people in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, but she said, yes, we'd love to have you come. And, but she didn't know me. She, we had never met. We had no relationship whatsoever. Um, they, she just took this on faith that because Matthias wanted to do this and that Matthias had written the piece and that I'd already conducted it, that she thought it would be fine. And so I went to their festival, uh, which is near Lucerne. And uh, they gave me their best players. Uh, it was just a stunning performance. Um, I actually have that photo up right now on the Facebook Low Flutes page is our header photo. Um, but we did it on his recital because they, you know, the guest artists get a recital. And we did it on his recital. And the, the kids, uh, kids, the people, <laughs> they're in their 20s. They're not kids anymore. Th th that I was conducting really liked what I'd done and how I worked with the group. And the Galways really liked me. And da -da -da. so... Uh, I went back home and then I started getting messages from Lady Jean and, and I'm, you know, I'm, why is she writing to me? And I realized, I said, do you want me to come back? <laughs> and she said, yes, we've invented a job for you. And so anyway, so we started Amazing. having a low flutes choir there. And so every year they let me have a group of whoever wants to be in the group. And they have at their festival, there's a group of, of people who are just unbelievably good players who are in Sir James class. And then anybody else who wants to uh, sends in um, an application and they can be in Lady Jean's class. So there's a huge variety of abilities uh, that go to this festival. And in Lady Jean's class, there are many adults, many, many adults, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s even, uh, plus younger kids. I mean, it, it runs the gamut. Anyway, so in this low flutes choir, I have a huge range of abilities, which makes it challenging. Um, and we also have to borrow instruments because we don't have enough for everybody who wants to play. And there'd be like 30 people would want to be in my group. And uh, But w they give me uh, 15 minutes on the final concert and we play our piece pieces and it's it's worked fabulously and and I have to say it's it's been a privilege to work with them and to hear some incredible students from around the world that I would never have had you know the opportunity to have heard you know people from Russia and South Africa and Czechoslovakia and I mean it's they're just amazing players out there so if any of you want to go to the Galway Festival again I'm, I'm waiting to hear if they're going to have it again um, I, I haven't heard anything yet. So, okay. but anyway, I that was, what yeah, you do, of course. I just sort of politely asked something, <laughs> Matthias, let's do this piece on your program. And, and then they offered me the opportunity to come and I'd never been to Switzerland. I, you know, and I'm loaded down with, you know, if you feel like a pack mule, unfortunately, when you play low flutes, you feel like a pack mule. Um, but I managed to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was it was really eye opening uh, to, to be at that festival. And again, they're welcoming of any ability levels. They don't. It's again it, getting into his class is difficult, um, but in her class, everybody's welcome. Well, you know, my last name is Swiss, so I feel like <laughs> you'll have to bring me next time. Yeah. 
<laughs> so my question for you, um, I always like to know how people got to where they are. And I, what I don't know about you is how did you get to be the low flutes person? You didn't start there, obviously, but now like you are the person. How did that happen? Very slowly. And, and, and with, um, you know, I didn't start out to be the low flutes person. I just loved the way the alto flute sounded. That's, that's what got me started. And I, uh, when I was an undergrad, we had an old Hanes that the, someone had rescued from a pawn shop, um, which I thought, okay, I'm having trouble with the first movement of the Bach A minor partita, uh, you know? And so if I, but if I can play it on alto, it'll be easier on C flute, right? So I would practice that, but it was a straight tube. And I just, I have rather, I'm sort of a shortish person my arms just weren't long enough. And so I didn't really think much about it anymore, but I really liked the sound. But then I went to um, uh, a National Flute Association convention, the first one I ever went to. And there in the exhibit area was a curved head alto. I didn't even know they existed. And I played one and I just, oh, you know, I had to have it. But it took me seven years to save up enough money to buy one. And once I bought it, uh, then the next question is, okay, uh, what am I going to play? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you start looking around and this was back in like 1985, uh, 84, I think it was 84, 1984. And there was very little next to nothing was out there in the stores because fl low flutes weren't very big at all. Flute choirs were just starting at that time. Mm -hmm. And of course that's mostly half notes and quarter notes. I mean, you're given, you know, hardly anybody has alto flutes and forget bass flutes. I mean, there were just so few of them. But anyway, so what am I going to play? And there was nothing out there. So there was a music store that had file cabinets full of catalogs from all the different music publishers. So I would go there about once a week and I would just start working my way through all mm. these catalogs in these file cabinets. And I came up with a list of music, which at that time there was more out there than I thought. Now, getting a hold of it is a whole nother problem. But there was actually quite a bit for wind ensemble or alto flute in wind ensembles, which I didn't oh. know. But anyway, so I had this list and I sort of published it. And this was before self-publishing was was a thing. And it, when I look back now at this thing, I just, oh. <laughs> but anyway, I put out this catalog of music for alto flute. And lo and behold, this low flutes maker from Holland that I didn't know, contacted me and said, well, I make, you know, alto flutes and I'd like to be able to give your catalog to the people who buy my instrument. And okay, that makes sense. So, but she's in Holland. So I, I mailed her a bunch of copies. Again, these were so crude. I'm embarrassed to even look at them now, but I mailed her a bunch of copies and she sent me a check in Gilders for the books. And so I have this check in Gilders and I take it to my bank and they say, ah, this is going to cost you more to cash than the check is worth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I sent the check back to her and I said, well, just buy me lunch at the next convention. I mean, you know, it, there you go. And of course, this person was Ava Kingma. Oh, <laughs> but wow. I didn't know. I didn't know who she was anyway, but so I, I met her for lunch. She bought me lunch and as a matter of professional courtesy, uh, this was about, I don't know, five years after I'd had my alto. I went to her booth or table as a matter of courtesy because she also made bases. And up to that point, bases were really not very good. They, they really, uh, they were just clunky, really awkward, didn't play well. Bleh. Anyway, but I played one of hers and I went, oh, gotta have one. <laughs> because her instruments actually play well. And so I ended up buying one of her basses and I guess the rest is sort of history. I, I have a Cotado now, uh, but I, I bought one of hers. I had one of hers for several years, uh, but you know, I just wanted to play music and I was just start, you know, looking around and then I'd organize groups of people to help me do stuff. And you know, you just start getting to know the other people who are into low flutes and you all sort of band together and you make things happen. And I seem to be the instigator most of the time, but I can drag people with me, you know, or no drag is the wrong word. I entice people to come along. <laughs> encourage. And, <laughs> <I> encourage. <laughs> and, 
you know, it just, it just evolved. And it wasn't because I wanted to be, you know, this, uh, the leader of the low flutes, whatever that is, but just cause I, I really like the instruments. They're good solo instruments. There's lots of good music. The sound is so cool. And it's more physical. When you play a low flute, there's more of a physical sensation. And, and I think that that sort of hooks us also um, because it's, you're, you're even more a part of the sound and the instrument on a low flute. And then, um, I can't believe I didn't think of this, but the, someone on the NFA approached me and I was up to be the next chair of the pedagogy committee at the time. And they approached me and said, well, do you want to be the chair of our new low flutes committee? And my initial thought was, why didn't I think of that? Um, but so then I had the choice. I said, well, can I be chair of both? And they said, no. And, oh. <laughs> and you know, and I thought, so you're thinking, okay, there are a bunch of other people who could be chair of the pedagogy committee, but only I could be the chair of the low flutes committee. So, mm -hmm. um, so I said, okay, we're doing the low flutes committee. And they, our first uh, NFA performance was at an Anaheim, Anaheim, California convention. And we uh, commissioned the, the committee that I was on. We commissioned an, a piece by Alexandra Molnar Suhaida called uh, Voices from the Deep. And we had, uh, I think 45 people uh, were playing. And Alexa Still was my uh, concert mistress and George Pope was in there. I mean, I had like three former presidents and they're all saying, you better not run over. And <laughs> And you anyway. did, right? <laughs> no, no. We managed to make it work, even though it was tough, because the stage, the stage was really small. I was, and so we had to sort of reconfigure the stage because we had a bunch of chamber music stuff going on beforehand, and you know. But it it worked, and I didn't get in trouble, and, <laughs> and they let me. They let me continue for next another couple of years. But you know, you just you just put your your interest out there and other people you sort of become a magnet and other people say oh there's somebody else who's interested in the things that i'm interested in i should talk to that person or get to know that person and so we all just you just make it happen i i seem to make things happen we love people <laughs> who make things happen <laughs> Um, and a few years ago is when you wrote the alto and bass flute method books. I did. I did. And I have, I have them right here. So because I realized, oh, there we go. Here you go. Yeah, here we go. It's backwards. I know. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I can't do that. that no, 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 you're good. I can't you're do good. this. <laughs> anyway, that's, there it is. And here's the bass method. Because I, again, I realized that I knew more about these instruments than almost anybody else. Mm -hmm. But I also had the skills to be able to turn them, to have a method. I had the teaching chops to be able to come up with exercises and uh, whatever it is I needed to put in the book, uh, alternate fingerings, all that stuff. I was the one who knew all that stuff and I knew how to get it into a book and to get it published and to get it out there. So again, that set of, of skills uh, all came together. And I took the pictures too. I, I, I especially like the one on the base method. You <laughs> had the flower theme going there. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about the covers of your books and how you have so many. Take the time, show us your books. Talk about the covers, uh, whatever you oh, want to do. Oh, okay. Well, um, th those two I just showed you. Mm -hmm. And then there's, of course, Christmas duets, ones we were just talking about. Here is my winter duets book. And this works for, um, you can have two C flutes, two piccolos, a C flute and an alto flute, uh, an alto flute and a bass flute. I mean, there's, there's different versions depending on what instrument. And this is in my front yard. <laughs> so this is like 12 feet tall, this sculpture. It's a, it was a tree that died and I had it carved into a bass flute. I was and it had a double trunk. It had a double trunk, which is why there could be a curve there. Okay. And here is um, this is my vibrato workbook. This is published by Falls House Press, um, and I was the one who found this picture because we were trying to figure out what are you going to put on the cover of a vibrato workbook? You know, I mean, yeah. but anyway, I realized a sine wave, of course. Um, here's my four Bach fugues. Again, this was a a picture that I had taken with my instruments. I just, you know, I was laying on the floor is what I was doing, laying on the floor. And then I have a stellar solos for alto flute. 
which, uh, you know, I just stellar meaning, you know, things that are really good. But then there's also the whole, you know, cosmos sort of star thing. So. But I, I really enjoy coming up with the covers of the books. It's, um, it just makes me smile to look at them. I mean, we, we've unfortunately sometimes, I mean, I understand the expense. It costs a lot to print a full color cover. And I know that's why lots of uh, publishing companies have gone to, you know, much plainer covers. Um, but, you know, especially now that we, so much is online that if you as a person are looking through, you know, flute specialist website, um, you're just going to get a little tiny picture of what the cover looks like. And if it's not interesting, you're probably not going to click on it. So it's in a way even more important than it ever was to have a visually interesting cover. And again, I go through, it's called KDP Publishing. It's a subsidiary of Amazon and they will publish full color covers and it's really not that expensive. So... And as the person who puts the covers on the Flute Specialist website, I love putting yours up there. They're very visually catching. And yeah, exactly. Them. And it's, again, it's just fun. I, it's something that I like to do. Um, but I do actually want to talk about, there's an upcoming Low Flutes Festival. We've decided, uh, Mariana Gariazzo, um, who is uh, someone I've known for a long time and worked with for a long time, is in charge this year. Um, I, again, last, when 2018, when I did the first one, it just, it was so intense. Again, I was telling Heather earlier, I had 14,000 emails just for dealing with that festival. And it's just, it's just overwhelming. So, well, she's come up with a different plan um, to try to cut down on, on uh, having to answer lots of emails because it, it gets really hard to keep up, let me tell you, and to keep all your details straight and who have I, who have I responded to and who haven't I responded to. Anyway, um, but Flute Specialists, yay, has donated money towards the bass competition. We're going to have a bass flute competition. Um, we're working on the website. I hope we'll have that up with a fair amount of information pretty soon. I have posted the repertoire on the Low Flutes Facebook group, uh, but it's going to be online. It's going to be in June, uh, the 16th through the 19th. It'll be online. And uh, and we still have the scarves. Remember, it was going to be in Japan in 2020. I was so disappointed. And the, the man uh, designed scarves for us for that. And then, of course, it didn't happen. But I just found out from him yesterday that he still has the ones from Japan. And so we're hopefully we'll we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with with that, because I'd like to they're silk they're fabulous <laughs> they're just, they're it's just beautiful <laughs> um anyway but that's that's going to be happening and we're we're working on trying to you know it's just a lot of details again just trying to figure out exactly how things are going to work and it just it's it's <laughs> it's very time consuming um but it should be really fun but i i wanted to mention that flute specialist has donated money towards our base competition uh, and that see, the NFA was having an alto competition, which I also started, by the way, because <laughs> see, I, I, I have a disease. You do it all. <laughs> I do it all. So the 2018 festival, I actually had some money left over. I know that seems hard to believe, but I had some money left over. And I also knew that I was not going to be in charge again because it is so much work. It's just, it was too much. And so I wasn't going to continue um, with my running of this festival. And in, in terms of the IRS, <laughs> I did not incorporate. I thought of becoming a 501c3, but I just, I, ugh, it's so much paperwork, people. It's just not what you want to do with your life. But anyway, so, but I called the IRS and I said, I have this money left over and, and it's, I don't feel like it's mine. I, I don't want to give it to myself. I've already given some to myself. I don't want to give this amount to myself. What do I, what can I do with this? I said, well, you give it to another 501c3 organization. So I, I contacted the NFA and said, I will give you this money if it can be used towards an alto flute competition. Nice. So again, that's how, you know, things just get started. Yeah. Anyway, so the NFA is, this will be the second year the NFA has had an alto competition. So if you play alto, you should look into that. Uh, look at the repertoire, try out for it. But because the NFA was doing an alto competition, I decided we should do bass. Hmm. So 
So I've seen in the comments some alto players, including somebody who plays in my flute choir. So thanks for being here, Hal. That's all right. Oh, I've seen lots of. I start at the top or the bottom here. Okay, um, Cottage Grove. I'm looking at the um, at the comments. Uh, okay, I'm just seeing if there are any questions here. Ah, yeah, just got the new book. Watching in Iowa City. Uh, Duet's book. What perfect time? Not stuck on one of those shipping barges. No, 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 no. They're all in in the states. They're all in the states. I get them. Uh, this KDP Publishing is a subsidiary of Amazon, and they have printers all over the U.S. They all come from the U.S. They're, they're not stuck in barges. No, and I have a whole pile of them over there. So <laughs> you go on the website and order them. Okay. Oh, Paul um, just said love alto. And so what I was going to say was for you alto players, if you're not yet an alto player. Maybe contact flute specialist and try an alto because you're going to want one. Every time I play alto, I'm like, why have I not bought an alto yet? <laughs> it needs to happen. I love playing alto flute. It it really, it's just warmer. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Now, if I'm about five five, and I sort of have short arms and legs, and I can't play the straight tube, it just my right hand is twisted too much. And it's just not, I just can't play the straight tube for more than four or five minutes. So if you're like me and you're on the short side, definitely get a curved head and, and you, I'll help you. I, I have uh, tutorials actually on my YouTube page to explain how to set up the curve. Cause that's sort of a little different. We're not used to, you know, having to deal with this curve here, but once you get it, it it's great. Um, and yes, it's in the it's in the key of G, but that's okay. The composers take care of all that for you. You do not have to transpose your part. <laughs> we know how to, it's just a little button. <laughs> it's a writing <laughs> software. It's not that big a deal. So they put it in the right key for you. Mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, yes, the curved head is a little bit less well in tune uh, in the third octave. It tends to be a quarter step sharp, but there are alternate fingerings that you can use. And I would much rather be working with some alternate fingerings than have damaged my right hand, mm. you know, because it's, it was so twisted playing the straight tube. You know, even the straight tube isn't in tune with itself. C flutes aren't really in tune with themselves either, you know? <laughs> so that's, so don't let that stop you. <laughs> It is a personal preference thing. Every time I, I think I need to spend more time and that, you know, I think that is a nice thing about how Flute Specialist has the trial program. You can try both head joints. You can find which, what will work for you. Then you can get Chris Potter's book to take you through and go to her website because you can spend forever just fishing through your website. There's so much great information. It is fantastic. And I already said that I need to stop going to your website because I want to buy every single thing now. <laughs> I will not have my next paycheck because it will all go to Chris Potter's books and sheet music and flute choir music. I want it all. It's all fantastic. So actually, there was another one. I just did the funeral march of their marionette Stop for, for Low Flutes Choir. We made that a movie project for people for Halloween. And that was really fun. And I'm debating all my other things I'm doing. If I should, it was for Low Flutes Choir, of course, but I could make it for regular C flute choir. Uh, again, it would, I, I'd have to uh, fuss with some octave displacement things, but I could do that, but there isn't going to be a market for it until, you know, yep, August. Yeah. So you Good time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I've got so many other things going on. I, what can um, you do? So tell us um, before, I always know as I get to the bottom of my cup of coffee, we're, we're at the end and I'm not there yet. So we have a little bit of time, but. Do you have any other upcoming um, events that you want to tell us about? Workshops, events, anything you want to tell us about? Well, I uh, I am in negotiations right now with a group in Baltimore, the Baltimore area, to have a retreat uh, in Baltimore. And, mm -hmm. you know, we haven't come up with a date yet. I have to send them a couple of options. But I haven't really had one on the East Coast. Um, I've had them. I had them here in Boulder for a number of years and I had one in California. I just had this one in Seattle. I've now, I had one in Chattanooga. Then we, we were alternating with the Huntsville folks. And so that was in Huntsville. We're going to be back in Chattanooga again uh, in October, which turns out to be a really nice time to be in that part of the country because it's not so hot. Um, but there'll be, yeah, coming up in Baltimore. Uh, yeah, I don't, I can't give you a date because we're still working on that. Uh, but that should be pretty fun. 
<laughs> and I'm sure I've got something else going on. I'm, I'm working on a, a piece for bass. Well, I'm not writing it, but uh, a performance for bass flute, um, a soprano and harp, which is really an interesting combination. It's called My Mother Talks of Clouds. Uh, it's a really interesting piece. And actually this weekend, I don't know how many of you uh, knew Ellen Ramsey. She was a fabulous flute repair person and just person. Uh, and she died back in February and we're having a memorial for her on Sunday. Hmm. So we're getting together and, and playing a bunch of stuff. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm sort of working on getting the next International Low Flutes Festival off the ground because we're just... We're just getting going. That and I've got to find time to exercise more. <laughs> you seem quite high energy. <laughs> and I haven't had caffeine. Wait till you see me on caffeine. I have I've not had caffeine this morning. Well, I can't um, do that. <laughs> but you know, things are things are going well. I'm sort of I had such a busy fall. I had so many airplane flights. I can't tell you. I can't. How many? Five. I had five different round trip flights um, to various places. Um, we have a cabin in northern Wisconsin where uh, we go kayaking, and and my husband was there most of the summer, and so I was sort of flying back and forth in between retreats and convention, and uh, you know, just it was uh, too many airports. They're just. Many airports. But after but a year of no airports, I mean. Better than no airport. Well, we have to drive. It's about a four hour drive up to our cabin from the airport that that's, that we flew into, which was Madison. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, that's where the relatives are. But um, so kayaking is fun. And I, several years ago, I played at that same Las Vegas convention where we did Matias's Low Flutes at High Tides. Oh, there's actually another little story involved with that. Uh, but I also did on that same, at the same convention, I did a piece I called Splish Splash. Mm -hmm. And I was in my kayak out um, on Lake Superior near the Apostle Islands, uh, which are just off of uh, Wisconsin. And they have these sea caves, they're sea caves, and the water comes in and it makes all these cool, low, boomy sounds. And so I was there in my kayak with my recorder, at right, one hand on the paddle, trying, trying to keep control of my boat while I'm recording this soundtrack. But anyway, I then turned it into a piece called Splish Splash and played it at the, the Las Vegas convention. And that was kind of fun. I'm not really a composer per se, but that was kind of fun. Um, but as, actually speaking of the, the thing with uh, Matthias's voices from the uh, low flutes at high tide, sorry, get my pieces mixed up. Um, the first time we read through it, there were so many new and unusual sounds that he was asking us to create. We're all just kind of going, what does he want? And the first rehearsal was horrible, yeah. absolutely horrible. And I had just recently talked a bunch of people into going over to the UK to the British Flute Society convention to play this piece. And I'm just, I was in shock. <laughs> this, it was horrible. I mean, <laughs> uh, but then Matthias came and he told us what he wanted. And all of a sudden it came together and it was, it became a piece I was conducting. It became a piece where the hair just sort of raises on the, it was so stunning, just completely new sounds. But anyway, initially I was just going, <laughs> no, we're going to go play this. And I've talked to all these people that are spending all this money to come over to the UK and it all works out. But it all worked out because it really, <laughs> it's a fabulous piece. It's just that there's some really new sounds in there that, that nobody else has created before. And we, we didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And um, but anyway, that all worked out. But, you, you know, you never know what you're going to get when you commission a piece. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as I am getting to the bottom of my cup of coffee okay. now, and that is my timer. But. We, uh, Flute Specialist has our first teacher appreciation event this week, guys. You were mentioning what you're doing Sunday, and we have that event on Sunday um, just to help support teachers through this mm -hmm. pandemic. We're still in the pandemic. We're coming out of the pandemic. We're not sure how to teach. It's, it's a really tough time to be a teacher. 
and you've been teaching online for a long time. So, yeah. you know, in, in one or two minutes, you want to, do you have any advice for teachers teaching online? Anything at all you want to say for teachers? Ah, uh, geez. Um, I caught you, you off guard. You have to know that sometimes things are going to work perfectly and other times it's going to crash. And you have to be ready to go to a different platform. So, I mean, we all know that Zoom can work really well. But there are other times when all of a sudden your student can't hear you at all and you shut things off and you go check your microphone settings and you, I mean, you do all that stuff and they still can't hear you or they, it works for another five minutes and then you go away again. I mean, you, yes. things are going to happen and you, again, if you can have a backup, uh, you know, and Skype is not perfect either, but I have had less trouble with the sound on Skype than I have on Zoom. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it so much depends on your own Internet connection. And if the student is going through a cell tower, like if they're on their phone and they're going through a cell tower, that's a problem. Um, mm -hmm. So you prefer that they that you or they be on a laptop and not on a, a cell phone going through a cell tower, because that can really mess things up, too. But um, I end up, you know, sending my students lots of stuff. I make sure that I have a copy of whatever it is they're working on because you need to be able to say, ah, measure 27, you know, you need to da 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 da. And so you don't have them there in the studio that you can go look at their music and point to it and say, this spot right there. Um, so that helps a lot. And I have folders for everybody. Um, so here's Keith's folder. <laughs> And so I have a folder and every, I have a lesson, I have a green lesson assignment sheet and I keep all the music that they're working on in their folder. And that's helped a lot to keep everything organized because you gotta, you're going to have a bunch of loose sheets of paper yeah. and you need to have something to put it in and you want to appear organized. <laughs> <laughs> it is a challenge. I once I had a student who was joining from the basement because he was in quarantine in his own home and he was on his cell phone and oh, that was a tough day. But that kid needed that lesson because that was his one thing to do <laughs> from the basement. Ah, <laughs> your one contact with the outside world. Yeah. You know, it does feel. I don't know if other people. This fall is just feels really strange to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's like we're sort of coming out of it, but. I just found out we're Colorado for some strange reason, which has been doing pretty well. We're now, we have the fifth highest number of cases right now. Mm. And our hospitals are starting to get to the point where they're saying, you know, we're going to have to send people to other hospitals. We don't have room for you. Uh, and I don't know, again, we were doing really well. I don't know what's happening right now, but we have an indoor mask mandate and at least in this County, it varies from County to County. And, but it's just, it just feels weird to me. Like we're not quite sure if we can move ahead or, or we should just sort of cool it. You know, I, it's, it's a weird time. Limbo. We're in limbo. We're in limbo. Yeah. But we are excited. You're doing some in-person events now and there are more coming. Um, I'm so thrilled that you were here virtually with us today. Cause this is a great thing that's come out of the pandemic. Yes. We do this. And as I'm to the bottom of my cup of coffee, I, I want to do our express round. Are you ready? Ah, okay. Uh, let me put on my glasses. Where'd they go? So I can read your, all right, go ahead. Oh, I'm not going to hold it up though. I'm going to tell ah, you. Ah, okay. You're just going to read it. Okay. But you can, you can wear the glasses if you'd like. <laughs> oh, they pull my hair out. So, all right, go ahead. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's this or that, although I might expand a little bit, but it's supposed to be just quick answer or you can skip. Okay. All right. First question, coffee or tea? Tea. I knew you were going to say that. Mm. Okay, but what's your favorite tea? Uh, I have um, just recently somebody sent me, oh, God, Sharon Byer. See, this brings me to Sharon Byer. Her uh, dried tragically of pancreatic cancer. Her sister sent me a box of tea. It's called Magic Flute Tea. I don't like tea, but okay, I would try it. It's, it's caffeinated. <laughs> okay, great. That's what it's I mean. It's caffeinated. It's called You're magic tea. Hey, tastes great. It's wonderful. Anyway. Lovely. Okay. Alto or bass flute? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Alto, I guess. It's it's just not as difficult to hold up. Okay, alto. Okay, so alto or contra, contra bass flute? Oh, alto, definitely. Okay, that one was easy. All right. Um, because you're in Colorado, I was thinking hiking or skiing? Both. 
Mm. Especially once I get my other knee replaced. Oh. Mm. <laughs> and now <laughs> I'm more thinking... one out. I should have said hiking, skiing, or kayaking, maybe. Oh, no, all three. I do all three of those, but not kayaking in Colorado. No, Kayaking no, no, no. is only in Wisconsin, but okay. skiing and hiking here. It has nothing to do with anything, but dogs or cats? Oh, cats. Yeah. Do you have cats? Not anymore. Okay. I don't have cats anymore. Mm. Um, because we just finished Halloween. We're heading to Thanksgiving, so I'm wondering, Halloween or Thanksgiving? Oh, Oh, that's a toughie because Thanksgiving's about eating and I like eating. <laughs> Halloween's about eating too. I know, but I don't eat sugar. So oh. I guess I have to say Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay, great. Because my follow-up questions are about Thanksgiving. So fantastic. Turkey or ham? Turkey. Okay, so the cranberry sauce. Do you have the real stuff or like the can? I don't eat cranberry sauce. Oh, so not. <laughs> fine. Okay, I'm almost done. Pumpkin pie or apple pie? Pumpkin. No. Oh, that's a toughie too. I have a, we have two huge apple trees and I've been making apple crisp like crazy. You know, uh, I guess apple, I'll say apple, but I don't put sugar in it. That's okay. But our shop is from Michigan. Apples are very big in Michigan. So good choice. Yeah. Good choice. Yeah. All right. So my last one of, of all the duets, and I know you have lots, do you have a favorite? Oh, they, uh, no, you can't do it. it was oh, that's hard. a tough question. Uh, you know, uh, oh, oh, my afternoon of a fawn in mm -hmm. my uh, fun flute duets book. That's another book that I have published by a British publisher. Uh, it's a, a little afternoon of a fawn duet that I made. Nice. I think that's probably my favorite. Fantastic. And of course, we're talking about your new duet book. Literally just came in the mail for me. I'm excited to play through it. Christmas duets with a twist. We're giving out one copy to the people who have commented. We'll choose one person. So it's your last chance. Get in a little comment so that you can be in the running to get an, uh, your own copy for free of this. And if you don't win it, go to our website and buy it. I'm, I haven't played it yet, but I've fished through and I know it's going to be fabulous. Oh, it's it's Again, it was fun. I don't do it unless it's fun. Okay, I'm just looking through the names and I sort of want to give this to somebody that I don't know, uh, just because I don't know them. How about Ellen Pashini? Oh, but you don't get to pick, we get to pick. I know, right. Okay, well, Ellen, I would have picked you because I don't know you. Ellen is one of our flute espresso, not natives. What do I want to say? She's at all of you. She's been at all of these. We love Ellen. I love you, Ellen. I hope you're still there so I can say we love you. But um, thank you so much for being here. It's just lovely to to be here with you, Chris. Thank you. Okay. And Keep I will go low, go low. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone.